All right. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, uh, coronavirus lockdowns and uh, remote seminars are, are um, have kind of have a silver lining for the, those of us like me who uh, don't travel a whole lot because it means that we get invited to give seminars like this. But it's also uh, a little bit of a mixed blessing because it means I also have lots of uh, lots less time to, with which to prepare to prepare such a talk um, between remote teaching and uh, homeschooling. So, um, if you uh, if you hear a little bit of screaming in the background, then uh, that's one of the reasons that I didn't have as much time to prepare this talk as I would have liked. Uh, so, I hope that everybody uh, will be forgiving uh, and uh, uh, yeah, not, not hold me to too high of a standard here. Uh, it seems that Eric, one one this. sorry sorry one. One listener is asking you to move the mic closer to your mouth. Okay. So maybe turning so up I the volume more is actually the, the right solution to that right. problem. We were struggling a little bit yeah. with the volume. Up some more. There, have we, have, is that better? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. It's, uh, it's funny, because I haven't had this trouble before, but maybe there's something wacky today. Okay, um, right. So, uh, uh, and among those, uh, am among that, um, uh, asking for forgiveness is that I don't have complete slides here already written. So, um, they, my slides go through maybe about uh, some fraction of the talk, and then I'm going to have to write them as we go. Uh, so, um, as John said, uh, the goal um, for the purposes of this talk, uh, my goal is to describe a way to. Uh, to give string diagrams for uh, cate closed symmetric monoidal categories uh, in a way that uh, is a little bit easier to work with, more like um, what we are used to for compact closed monoidal categories. So I want to start with some review of what those words mean uh, and uh, what the string diagrams are that we're comparing to, and then I'll go through the various pieces of this construction. Um, and uh, as uh, as John mentioned on the on on, on Zulip yesterday, I guess there's a uh, my my preprint uh, involving this went up uh, a day or two ago on the archive, um, so you can find it there, um, including a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to have a chance to talk about today. Okay, so uh, so let's start uh, by reviewing string diagrams for symmetric monoidal categories. Uh, so if C is a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, which I'll abbreviate SMC, then um, are the string diagrams for C. Uh, we generally draw uh, morphisms in C as nodes, and then the uh, objects of C are the strings or the, the wires or, or uh, lines that come in and out, uh, and we put arrows on them. So if this is F here is a morphism from A tensor B to C tensor D tensor E, uh, and the arrows that are next to each other uh, are uh, tensor to implicitly tensored together. Uh, and if there are no arrows at all, as we see over here for G, uh, then uh, that means we have a unit object, which I'm writing as capital I. And uh, we can, uh, because we, we, we have the sort of implicit tensoring, we don't always, we often we don't actually need to consider tensor product objects, but if we do, then uh, we can use sort of tensor nodes as I've drawn down here on the bottom, uh, just the identity morphism from A tensor B to A tensor B, we can regard as taking an A and a B in at the top and putting out an A tensor B at the bottom or vice versa, because uh, these A and the B next to each other are implicitly tensored. Uh, and, uh, um, when we uh, put these diagrams together, then uh, this uh, tells us about how to compose these morphisms and tensor them together. So here I've drawn a picture of an F composed with a G along a, a pair of objects uh, C and B, C tensor B, uh, with a, with another string F along the uh, the side that doesn't interact, uh, and this is, can be interpreted as uh, F tensor, or sorry, F, little F tensor the identity uh, composed with G tensor with some identities along the appropriate object. So hopefully people have seen this sort of thing uh, at least once or twice before. Uh, and in particular, uh, this is particularly useful when we want to talk about objects with duals uh, in the usual monoidal category sense. So uh, to recall a dual of an object A is an object A star uh, together with um, a unit and a co-unit or a, uh, an evaluation and a co-evaluation, uh, which uh, are basically a version of, the, of an adjunction that um, expressed in this monoidal category. So um, the eta goes from the unit object to uh, a tensor a star. The epsilon goes from a tensor a star tensor a down to the unit object. And if we draw these as string diagrams, then there's just sort of um, cups and caps turning a string around. So so technically speaking, uh, you sort of you would expect that we might sort of draw an eta 
in there uh, and an epsilon in there. Uh, but we don't usually go ahead and actually draw those. Usually we just um, turn, bend the string around and say that's implicitly uh, an eta or an epsilon. And then the zigzag or triangle identities for a duality dual pair, um, uh, as I've drawn over here on the right, are just um, straightening a bent string. If you have a string that just sort of has a zigzag in it, you can pull it straight and it's the same thing. So this is a very topological flavor, uh, makes it very convenient to work with. And uh, if every object has a dual, then we call C a compact or compact closed or rigid monoidal category. Uh, and uh, a category that's compact is automatically a closed monoidal category uh, with an internal hum, um, A brackets, brackets A comma B, is defined as the dual of A tensored with B. Uh, and so here I've drawn uh, some of the structure of a closed monoidal category in terms of this uh, straightening, uh, this, these cups and caps. So if I have a morphism F from A tensor B to C, and I want to uh, curry it to get a morphism from A to um, uh, the Homs from B to C, right? Uh, then what I do is I just uh, compose it with the unit, which means just taking this B string and bending it around to the bottom, right? So this, this here is, is implicitly C tensored with B dual, which is the Hom from B into C. And uh, on the other side, uh, I can uncurry or I have an evaluation morphism that maps uh, the hum from B to C tensored with B into C. So I think of an element of B, B comma C as a, as a function from B to C internally and I evaluate it on some object element of B. That's what this morphism I think of is doing. And in the string diagrams, this is just, I'm just putting one of these caps on the end of the B and the B dual, turning it around and then continuing the C string all the way down to the bottom. Uh, and then the uh, uh, curry uncurry laws. Um, I've, for instance, I've drawn one over on the right here. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, like over on the left, like this, this B hom C, I could actually make a single morphism that comes out of the bottom down here, uh, landing in B hom C, which is uh, C tensor B, B star uh, by composing with one of these uh, tensor uh, nodes, which again is just the identity morphism. Uh, and then over here on the right on the box, I've shown um, one of the, uh, the interpret the version of one of these triangle or zigzag laws in the case of uh, the closed monoidal category. So if I take an F, uh, a morphism from a, a tensor B to C, and I curry it to get a morphism from A to B, to hum from B to C, and then I take that morphism and I evaluate it at some element of B, uh, then what I've got is I've just got a cup and a cap together and I can pull that string straight and get back my original morphism F. So, so currying and uncurrying are inverses in this very sort of topological sense. So this gives us a very nice way to work with um, closed structure, uh, value, uh, currying and uncurrying uh, by doing just topological deformations, uh, but it only works for categories that are compact, uh, where we have uh, actual dual objects rather than just internal HOMs. So it's natural now to wonder, what about um, closed symmetric monoidal categories that are not compact? Um, so, and there are of course lots of these in the world, right? Like set, for instance, is closed metamonoidal, Cartesian closed, in fact, uh, as any Cartesian closed category or abelian groups or vector spaces, lots of familiar categories are closed symmetric monoidal, but are not compact. Not every object has a dual. In fact, in the Cartesian monoidal case, um, only the terminal object can possibly have a dual, I believe. Uh, and in this case, it seems like we need some extra information, at least in the string diagrams, because for instance, if I draw three strings here, uh, may for instance, with one of them sort of going up, representing B dual, I think I forgot to mention explicitly that we draw the arrows on the strings going up when they represent a dual object, um, so that they sort of continue uh, or in an oriented sense going up and down uh, or down and up around the caps and cups. <clears throat> in a closed symmetric monoidal category, this could represent any of these things on the right that I've drawn. It could be the hom from B to A tensored with C, or it could be the hom from B to C tensored with A, or it could be the hom from A to B to A tensor C. And all of these objects are different uh, in general in a closed symmetric monoidal category, whereas in a compact monoidal category, they are canonically isomorphic to each other, so it doesn't matter. So uh, as John mentioned uh, in the, his paper with Mike Stay in the Rosetta Stone, uh, they paper they proposed to uh, to carry this information with clasps and bubbles. Um, so uh, over here on the left, I've drawn um, these clasps, which are in green, which indicate sort of uh, uh, which object the B is hommed into. 
Right, so here we could have B hummed into A or B hummed into C uh, with the clasp going to the left hand string or the right hand string. If I want to hum B into A tensor C, uh, well, I could sort of have two clasps or I could uh, sort of combine the A and the C with a tensor node uh, into a single string, the different ways you could imagine doing that. Uh, and then the currying and the evaluation, uh, we, re we essentially draw the same pictures uh, with the clasp added, but then we put these blue bubbles around uh, the, the, uh, the cap and the cup. Uh, and uh, the, bu the, the bubbles are there to prevent uh, drawing illegal operations, things that we can do, that we could do in a compact monoidal category that we can't do uh, in a closed symmetric monoidal category. Uh, and the primary illegal operation we have to worry about uh, is the trace. So in a compact monoidal category, I can take um, the, uh, the unit of an object A and compose it with some morphism F and then compose that with the co-unit down at the bottom. And this gives me a map from the unit object to the unit object, which is called the trace of the morphism F, uh, because in familiar cases like vector spaces or whatever, where um, this object uh, has to be finite dimensional in order to have a dual, uh, this does in fact compute the trace in the usual linear algebra sense. Uh, but most closed symmetric model categories do not have traces of this kind for all objects, only for those which are sort of finite in some sense, uh, like having finite dimensional. Um, so we can't expect to be able to draw this in a general picture for a closed symmetric model category. And the bubbles are what prevent us from doing this in their proposal. And we're only allowed, basically the point is we're only allowed to have a cap for down here, for instance, uh, when there's some particular object down here, some string going through the bubble uh, alongside of it, and sort of that thing isn't allowed out of the bubble. Uh, and in fact, traces are the only problem, roughly speaking. Um, Joel Street and Verity in their paper on trace monoidal categories showed that um, a symmetric monoidal category can be embedded into a compact monoidal category precisely when it admits a trace structure in some formal sense. So uh, it's, it, the structure is induced from the duals uh, on a, uh, if you have a compact monoidal category and that passes to any subcategory of it, sub monoidal category. Uh, and conversely, they showed that if you have a, a trace structure, then you can use that to construct uh, an embedding into a closed symmetric monoidal category. So, um, so how can we get away, how can we deal with um, closed symmetric monoidal categories that are not compact and are not even traced is the problem that I want to consider. Uh, and uh, so we might start by asking, uh, what is it that's different about a trace uh, diagram versus the other diagrams that we do want to allow, like the zigzag identities? Uh, and uh, one way to, to one thing we might notice about it is that the trace involves a loop, uh, which topologically means it's not simply connected. It has sort of a, a fundamental group to it, topologically speaking. Uh, and so we might think, well, what kind of monoidal category can we can we use uh, in which the string diagrams all have to be simply connected, where we forbid loops? Uh, and uh, one way to forbid loops um, is to use a different tensor product for the inputs and the outputs. Uh, so this may not be the, ob the, the obvious first thing that you would guess, uh, but it turns out to be a, a useful idea. So this, this, this kind of category is called a linearly distributive category. It was originally called a weakly distributive category when Pocket and Seeley defined it, but nowadays everyone calls it linearly distributive. Um, and uh, it's equipped with two different symmetric monoidal structures uh, and together with some structure and axioms on the, relating them that I will um, describe a little bit more about later. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna write these two um, different monoidal structures like this. Uh, so one of them is a square box tensor uh, with the top uh, as its unit. And the other one is uh, a 45 degree rotated version of that, uh, sort of a, a diamond plus, you might think of it as with a bottom as its tensor. Um, there are a lot of different notations for these tensor products. It's sort of um, uh, possibly the most common one uh, is for this one to be denoted with an ordinary tensor symbol uh, and uh, this one over here to be denoted with uh, this funny upside down ampersand, which I, you can tell that I'm not a linear logician because I have to sort of try really hard to be able to write this. Uh, and this is sort of uh, the, the original notation that Girard used when, in, for linear logic, which is the um, internal language of these things, internal um, type theory. Um, I don't like this, uh, in, especially in, in the category theory context, because they're not obviously dual to each other. Uh, right? In category theory, we like to use sort of dual notations for uh, dual constructions. Um, and so uh, some people have uh, have used uh, a, uh, 
uh, for just a 45 degree rotated version of a tensor symbol here. Uh, but I don't like that either because that looks like a direct sum uh, or a byproduct and uh, that's certainly not what we're looking at here. Um, so I like this, this square thing. And the other advantage of this square thing is that the, uh, the square tensor is, uh, can be distinguished from the circle tensor uh, in, a, in a symmetric monoidal category, which we're going to have to do later on. And now the way we draw string diagrams for these things is that uh, a picture like this with three, three strings coming in the top and two at the bottom, um, now it means uh, I take the A, B, and C on the top and I implicitly tensor them with the, um, with the, blo the box tensor, but then the output strings D and E, I implicitly tensor them with the other tensor, which is sometimes called the co-tensor uh, or the plus, uh, the plus tensor. And similarly, uh, if I have no strings coming in, that means uh, the unit of the box tensor top. And if I have no strings going out, that means the unit of the plus tensor, the bot, the, the cotensor at the bottom. Uh, and this may look a little bit weird, um, but uh, one nice thing about it is that it allows us to draw duals in the following way. So um, I can draw the same string diagram pictures, right? So here's a, a cup and a cap for A and a, a star in a linearly distributed category. Uh, and, uh, but now they're interpreted in a different way because right, the, the, the unit eta comes from no strings, which is the top uh, unit of the, the box to the, the times tensor, the tensor, but it go maps to a cotensor uh, A star because that's a two things on the output. And on the other side, the epsilon comes from A star box tensor A, but it goes to the bot, um, the unit of the cotensor. And then we'd like to have these sort of zigzag uh, identities. Um, but now we have to interpret what on earth that means. And this is where we need the structure that relates the two tensor products. So over here, I've drawn the one of these zigzag laws. And now let's interpret what that means in the linearly distributive category. So we have A maps to top tensor A um, by an, this is sort of the unit isomorphism of tensor. And now I apply this eta that maps to A cotensor with A star. And then on the other side, I have to end up at A. And so that comes from A uh, cotensor bot and bot comes from uh, epsilon, which is from, comes from A star box, A star tensor A. Uh, but now the parentheses are different here. Uh, and if they were, if the, if the two tensors were the same as they are in an ordinary symmetric monoidal category, I would just have an associativity isomorphism, but here I don't because they're not, they're different tensors. And so this is the structure of a linearly distributive category that I have to put in here is called the, the linear distributor or, or whatever you want to call it, which is a consists of a map as in general from a cotensor B uh, quantity uh, tensor C to a cotensor, the quantity B tensor C. I think uh, I'll, it has to set very ax axioms. Yes. I think I'll read someone's question. Please. Uh, so someone's asking, what's the meaning of star in such a category? Is it an additional structure? Um, in, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a property of the object A to have a dual in the same sense that in a, in a symmetric monoidal category, uh, I can ask whether a given object has a dual, uh, which is sort of an object equipped with this stuff. I can ask whether in a linear distributive category, an object A has a dual A star, which is equipped with all this stuff. Now, in a symmetric monoidal category, we're sort of familiar with the fact that a dual is unique up to, canon up to unique isomorphism when it exists. And that's also true in the linear distributive case. So even though it's stuff, it's, it's uh, essentially a property. It's, it's unique up to unique isomorphism. It's, it's just that not all of them have it, right? Because then we would have a compact closed category. Well, in, the, in this monoidal case, uh, not every object has a dual necessarily. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and, and if they do all have them, then we have a compact closed category. Uh, in a linear distributive category, uh, again, not every object may have a dual, but um, having all objects having a dual doesn't make us compact closed in this case. It makes us star autonomous. So I haven't written that down yet, but that's, that's the, the, the upshot. Okay, uh, speak up again if, uh, if that wasn't enough or you have more questions. Thanks. Great. Okay, so we can define this notion of duality. Uh, and the important point is that this kind of duality doesn't allow us to construct a trace because the tensor, the, the tensor and the cotensor don't match up here. But if I try to construct a trace by making a loop like this, then uh, my, and the, the, I have top mapping to A cotensor A star, uh, and in the bottom I have A, tens, a star 
I guess I should have put the star on the other side here. Um, uh, a, a star tensor A mapping to bot. Uh, and in the middle here, there's no sort of uh, an analog of the uh, symmetry or equality that we could put there to just change the, the cotensor into a tensor. Um, one other bit about the um, string diagrams here uh, that I wanna mention. So in the, in the monoid, symmetric monoidal case, uh, we had these tensor nodes that could take an A and a B and make them into an A tensor B or vice versa, uh, that were basically just identities, uh, identity morphisms. And we have the same thing in two cases. Uh, in the linearly distributive case, we can map A and B into A tensor B, or we can map A cotensor B into A and B, and those give us identity morphisms. Those are, are identity morphisms because remember the input is implicitly tensored with the tensor, but the outputs are implicitly combined with the cotensor. We'd also be able, like to be able to take a morphism with two B and a C coming out at the bottom and turn it into one with a single string with a B cotensor C coming out at the bottom. Uh, and so in order to do that, we give ourselves the sort of the dual tensor and cotensor nodes that I've drawn over here uh, that take an A and a B at the top and turn them into an A cotensor B and an A tensor B at the top and turn them into an A and a B come out at the bottom. But those are not morphisms in the category D. They're just sort of formal bits of string diagram syntax. Uh, and that makes the validity criterion more complicated. I don't want to get into the details of all of this, but um, just to mention that it's known. Uh, so you're, you're, we're, we, want, we want to allow us to sort of to take uh, an A tensor B and turn it into an A and a B and then put those back together into an A tensor B. So that's okay, even though it's not simply connected anymore, it has a loop. Um, but we, we don't want to allow ourselves to take an A tensor B and turn it into an A and B and put those back together into an A cotensor B because that's something we can't do. We don't have a map between the two tensor products. So there's a, there is a theorem here, pr pr global proof net criterion is what it's called. It goes, uh, these sorts of criteria are go all the go back to Girard's uh, proof nets for linear logic and they've been simplified by various other people. Uh, and generalized. Um, so if, as long as there aren't units, then you can express this condition fairly simply that um, it has to become simply connected if we cut one of the, the paired edges of each of these formal uh, non-morphism non nodes. So we either cut one of, one, of, one of the two coming into one of these plus nodes or coming out of one of these times nodes. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a nice, there's a long paper by uh, Lutcock at Seeley and Trimble, uh, Natural Deduction and Coherence for um, Linearly weekly distributive categories, I think, where they show how to deal with the, 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 the units as well, um, based on some sort of, it, you have to actually augment the, the, the string diagrams a little bit um, that uh, Trimble uh, invented this sort of rewiring criterion where the units have to be attached to something or other. So I don't want to get into the details of this here, but just to say that there is a, a, a string diagram calculus that works in general, and there is a criterion for validity, which is sort of roughly simple connectedness, but it, it gets more complicated if you want to allow all these extra nodes. Okay, so, um, so the, the punchline of, of introducing linear, linear distributivity is that, as I said before, if all the objects have duals, then it's called star autonomous. Uh, and uh, in fact, star autonomous categories historically were defined by Barr before linearly distributive categories were, um, because in the star autonomous case, you can recover the cotensor from the tensor by dualizing and then tensoring and then dualizing again. Um, but uh, this, is, this is various different ways of defining this. And just like a compact closed category is automatically closed, a compact category is closed, a star autonomous category, um, the tensor is closed and the cotensor is co-closed. So we don't worry about that, but it's just sort of self-dual. Um, and the internal hum, which I'm writing with angle brackets to distinguish it, is the same, right? Remember, the, remember in, a, in, a, in a compact closed category, the internal hum was A star tensor B. But here in a star autonomous category, the internal hum this is the internal hum relative to the tensor, but the internal hum is defined by A star cotensor B. And now we can just draw the same pictures that we had before in the compact closed category without any clasps and bubbles. Um, I just uh, compose with this dual thing, this, the, um, this, this unit, and I turn my B around. And now what comes out the bottom here is uh, C cotensor uh, B star, right? Um, so this is, because uh, um, remember the, the, the objects that come out are implicitly cotensor together. And that's the, uh, the internal hum a, a co, uh, from A to B. And on the similar to the evaluation, um, right, this, this thing up here, hum from B to C tensor B is uh, uh, B, um, let me write it like this, um, C uh, cotensor B star uh, t 
tensor B, and then we have the linear, linear distributivity that turns that into C cotensor B star tensor B, uh, and now I can use the evaluation, um, the, the, co, the, the co unit at C, uh, epsilon to go to C cotensor uh, bot, which is just C. Um, so the same pictures make sense. Uh, this is what the string diagrams mean, just as in a compact category. Um, and, but it's more general than a compact category. Um, and so we know, right, we know that we can't take an, or, an arbitrary closed symmetric monoidal category and embed it into a compact monoidal category because it may not have a trace. But so now we can ask, we have a, more, we have a better question to ask, can I take an arbitrary closed symmetric monoidal category and embed it into a star autonomous category? Because that, uh, at least the, the problem with a trace is, gonna, is gone because I don't have traces for duals in a star autonomous category. And if we could do that, then we could just use the string diagrams for that embedding star autonomous category and just sort of restrict them to the, uh, the image of the embedding. So Robin, excuse me. Uh, yes. So Robin Peterloo had a question, somewhat pointed question, I guess, <laughs> which is saying, uh, have you replaced the clasp and bubbles by a global criterion for the validity of these string diagrams? Um, basically, the, that's the idea. Uh, yes. Uh, and if the, if the question was intended to imply that that might not be, a, be an improvement, uh, <laughs> then uh, this is a, a, a decision that anybody has to make in, in any part in particular application. It could be that there are cases in which the clasps and bubbles are better. Um, I like this approach because uh, seeing that a diagram is simply connected is a very intuitive topological like notion to me, uh, especially, uh, uh, and the, the, whereas the class and bubbles, the correctness criterion is a little bit maybe tricky to formulate. When can you pop a bubble? When can you not pop a bubble? I don't know whether it's actually been written down completely formally or not. Maybe John can speak to that. Uh, um, no, it, it, no, I don't think it has. Okay. Um, so somebody well, could do it. Yeah. Another thing is you mentioned that the simple connectedness criterion when you don't have the uh, these units around, mm -hmm. and I'm just sort of wondering like how hard is it to tell if a diagram is uh, well formed if there are those units around? Is it like can you learn how to do it pretty intuitively, um, or is it like I I don't I don't hard? know the answer to that. Uh huh. Okay. Um, I, I, I know, that, I believe that there's, a, there's an efficient algorithm by which a computer can do it, uh, but that's a different question uh, to whether a human can learn to do it uh, easily. Uh-huh. Okay. It, it's not that much different, actually. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so the question is, can we take a close monoidal category and embed it into a star autonomous category so that we can use the string diagrams from there for the closeness structure? Uh, but actually an even more basic question, which you've probably been asking yourself is, do we know any star autonomous categories at all? Um, so first of all, uh, the simple, simple case that's sort of the degenerate case is that a symmetric monoidal category is linearly distributive if we take the two tensors to coincide, the tensor and the cotensor. And in that case, the dual is just reduced to ordinary compact duals. Uh, another example is that if I have a Boolean algebra regarded as a category with, uh, as a poset, which is a category, then it's star autonomous, where the tensor is the conjunction, the and, the cotensor is the disjunction, the or, and the dual is the negation. Uh, so, uh, and this is sort of leads into, this is like classical logic, which then generalizes to classical linear logic, which is sort of the, um, the logical version of a star autonomous category. Um, but Boolean algebras don't categorify really well uh, for various reasons. And so we sort of need different constructions to get um, non post examples. Um, the, uh, one of the most useful and uh, especially the most intuitively useful to me constructions of a star autonomous category is called the Chu construction. Um, so let me try to sketch this for, for people who haven't seen it before. Um, so let's start with a simple case. Um, we've got a close symmetric middle category C. We want to make it into a star autonomous category. Um, star autonomous category has this dual operation. So everything, so in particular, it's equivalent to its opposite. Okay. So a natural thing to try is to take C times C op. Uh, as, uh, as our star autonomous category. We want to give it a star autonomous structure. So how can we do that? Well, um, 
one thing we can try is to just use the structure of C uh, on the first components, right? So an object of D now is a pair of two objects with I'm writing A plus and A minus. And so the morphisms go forwards in the first components and backwards in the second components. Uh, so let's define the tensor of A plus A minus and B plus B minus to be A plus tensor B plus in the first component. And we'll worry about the second component later. And similarly for the, the unit top is gonna be just the identity unit object and we'll worry about the next component later. Um, now, now let's think about the internal HOM in uh, this category D. Right? So um, we wanna know uh, uh, what this, this internal HOM of A and B is going to be. So this uh, in the, our star autonomous category. Uh, and uh, um, let's think about uh, what, ma what, those, what maps into this thing from the unit object are. And so a map from, into, from a unit object into an internal HOM uh, is just a morphism from one object to another object. Uh, right, uh, and since, since this is uh, this this the underlying category is C times C op, that's just a morphism forwards on the the plus objects and backwards on the minus objects. Uh, and now let's curry those morphisms again uh, in C and make them into a map from the unit object into A plus to the hom from A plus to B plus, and a map from the unit object into the hom from B minus to A minus. And now this is just two maps out of the unit object, so it's a map from the unit object into a Cartesian product. So it's natural to guess, right, because the, the first component of um, this uh, unit object here is the unit object of C, uh, down, which appears down here. It's natural to guess that the first component of this internal HOM in D should be uh, this thing over here. Uh, and in that case, uh, a morphism up here uh, is going to, um, in particular involve a map from the unit object of C to this guy, which we've said has the right, represents the right thing. And then it's gonna also involve a map backwards on these question marks. Uh, but we can get rid of that if we take the uh, second component of the, uh, the top unit to be the terminal object, because then um, this will just be the terminal object and this map will be unique. Okay. So, uh, so that, um, the, that gives us uh, a guess for the first component of the internal HOM, as well, along with our guesses for the first components of the tensor and the unit. But in fact, that's enough to determine everything uh, because the internal HOM uh, of a star autonomous category can be expressed as the dual, right? right it's uh, it's this, this cotensor thing with a dual, but the, the cotensor can be expressed in terms of the tensor. Uh, so I, did, I mentioned this briefly, uh, but I didn't, I didn't go into it very deeply. Um, so, but it turns out that this cotensor, can, this internal HOM can be written as A tensor B star and all of that star. So uh, if, we, uh, if we write out what that means, right? So uh, A tensor B star at the star is uh, uh, the duality flips the components, right? Um, of, of C and C op. And so this is A plus A minus tensor B minus B plus and then we use our definition of the first component of uh, the tensor to get a plus tensor B minus in the first component. And we don't know what the second component is. But now we dualize this again and the A plus tensor uh, B minus comes in the second component. But this over here, this is just the internal HOM. And we, all, we also said that the first component of the internal HOM should be um, this thing here. So now we've won both the first and the second components of the internal HOM. Uh, so we know what it is. And uh, now we can, from that, we can go backwards and deduce the, the tensor product as well, which ends up being this, um, the tensors in the first component and a, a product of um, uh, these internal HOMs in the second component. Um, so this gives us a star autonomous category, which is called the Chu construction, uh, Chu of C1. Uh, that one uh, has to do with the one that appeared back here in the unit object. Uh, and the, uh, the embedding, uh, which I didn't write down here, takes an object A and maps it to the pair A comma one. Uh, so that is a strong symmetric noidal functor, which embeds C into this star autonomous category. So we're making progress, but it's not generally a closed embedding. And you can compute what the internal HOM between these things is, and it doesn't agree with the internal HOM that we started with in C embedded into here, um, in general. Sometimes it does, if, if say if C has a zero object, then it works, but in general it doesn't. Okay. <clears throat> so we need to do something that's a little bit fancier. 
Uh, and here I'm running out of slides, run out of my slides, so I'm gonna have to start writing. Uh, so first of all, um, there's a more general Chu construction um, it, where if we, uh, if we choose an object of C to be the dualizing object, um, then we can uh, replace this object one up here that, uh, by something more general. Um, and so in this case, uh, we, the underlying category, uh, we take uh, the morphisms, uh, the objects to be pairs of two objects together with uh, sort of an, uh, a pairing map that maps into our dualizing object. Uh, and then the morphisms from this guy to uh, a B plus and a B minus and a pairing uh, on B consist of a morphism forwards and a morphism backwards uh, such that um, a square commutes. And I will leave it to you to uh, write down that square. Right. So this defines uh, uh, a category Chu of CD uh, which uh, generalizes that um, case. And then in that case, the, uh, the pullback, the, the products uh, become pullbacks. And you can, uh, you can read about this uh, anywhere that, you, that writes about the Chu construction um, on, the, on the internet or uh, in my preprint. <laughs> this general version goes all the way back to Chu and then Mike Barr. Uh, and I just I want to sort of uh, take a moment to try to sell you on uh, the, you, the interestingness of the Chu construction if you aren't already sold on it, um, which is, uh, and one reason it's interesting is that it lots of, uh, lots of dualities embed in, in these guys. Um, so for instance, um, if, uh, if we start from vector spaces, uh, and the dualizing object is the under the, the, the ground field, uh, then uh, the category of Hilbert spaces is included in the Chu construction. Um, uh, Hilbert spaces meaning uh, objects, uh, vector spaces V equipped with an inner product, which is now this pairing mapping down to the ground field uh, and the morphisms are sort of linear maps together with their adjoints. Um, so other sorts of dualities, if I take C to be cat uh, and uh, D to be set, uh, then uh, the category of categories together with adjunctions sits inside the Chu construction, uh, where uh, now a category A uh, appears as A and its opposite together with its hom functor, which we consider as sort of a pairing mapping uh, A cr cross A into set. Um, this, for this, you have to sort of use the two chu construction, which is up to isomorphism. But um, that's uh, something for category theorists to worry about making precise. Um, uh, other examples you can take, for instance, if, if C is set uh, and D is uh, say, uh, the two element set or the, the set of truth values, um, then uh, you can include topological spaces uh, by uh, considering uh, a, a topological space paired with its uh, open set lattice and membership. And so in that case, you have a function going forwards and then a map going backwards, which is um, the pre-image map on open sets and that gives you continuous maps. Um, and uh, you also, various other constructions include things like stone duality uh, for uh, Boolean rings and, and stone spaces, uh, Pontryagin duality, locally compact abelian groups uh, and so on. Right? So somehow two constructions are a very general and canonical way to talk about categories equipped with dual structures or self dualities. Okay. So, um, so our goal is to use some kind of a two construction to build some kind of an embedding of a closed symmetric monoidal category into uh, a star autonomous category. Uh, and the, the tool that we're going to use for this is uh, poly categories. So um, if we're category theorists, we know that everything is better with a, with a uh, universal property. Uh, so you may have seen uh, the notion of a multi-category, uh, which um, gives a universal property to uh, tensor products in a, an arbitrary monoidal category. So a multi-category uh, multi has uh, HOM sets that look like this, where the input, um, uh, the, uh, the domain is allowed to be a list of objects uh, and the output is a single object. Uh, and then you can consider a representability uh, property that this is equivalent uh, or isomorphic to Homs out of some tensor product 
uh, into uh, the same uh, output. <coughs> uh, similarly, a poly category uh, does the same thing for a linearly distributed category or a star autonomous category. And now we have, uh, we're allowed to, uh, a list of objects in the domain as well as a list of objects in the codomain. Uh, and the representability property would be uh, that um, we're allowed to tensor together all the A's in the domain and cotensor together all the B's in the codomain. Uh, and for those people uh, who are familiar with props, uh, which are also a generalization of multi-categories or a version of multi-category-like things uh, that allow multiple things in the input and multiple things in the output. Um, the difference with a polycategory is that uh, we, uh, uh, we only allow uh, composition along one object. Um, which is basically a way of, of requiring this sort of simple connectivity uh, restriction. So, uh, for instance, uh, this uh, this sort of this sort of picture that I drew at the beginning uh, in a uh, in a mono symmetric monoidal category um, is his okay in a prop, but not. Uh, in a poly category because uh, I have these uh, two different objects that I'm composing along and so I get a loop it's not simply connected. The the canonical sort of general picture of composition in a poly category is that you have um, f with a bunch of things coming in uh, and uh, one thing coming out that you compose along uh, and then the rest of the things that come out of F hang around in the, in the, in the output. And then a G has a one thing coming in that you compose along and the rest of the things coming into it come, uh, hang around in the input. Right. Um, now, uh, poly categories are gonna be sort of the, uh, the intermediate step that we're gonna use. Um, we're going to start from our closed symmetric monoidal category and we're going to make it into a poly category uh, and then we're going to embed that in a star autonomous category. Although actually this uh, I'm going to factor that this is going to factor um, through another closed symmetric monoidal category of modules uh, and then uh, at the end we're going to do the two construction to get a star autonomous category which is called the envelope. Okay, so um, the, the poly category, if C is a closed symmetric monoidal category, the poly category we're interested in, I'm going to write as star C. Uh, and the idea is um, that we, uh, we formally add duals to C. So um, we, have, uh, we have new objects, um, say uh, A star. Um, for all A and A, uh, and then uh, a morphism from, I'm just going to do an example here, uh, say a morphism from A and B to uh, C star and D and E star uh, in, in this new star C poly category is just going to be a morphism from A, B, C, and E uh, to D in C. So I'm writing this in multi-category notation, but this is um, just a uh, map from these from this tensor. And so the idea is um, we just uh, we take this um, morphism in C and we formally bend around the the, uh, the arrows um, to give ourselves new morphisms in, in star C. Uh, and in particular, what that means is that uh, in star C, uh, a lot of HOM sets are empty um, because uh, I have to sort of have only one output uh, for the morphisms in C. So uh, I can't, uh, uh, for instance, uh, have uh, um, something like a to a comma b mapping to c comma d uh, where these are not dual, not formal duals. <laughs> uh, 
Now, um, the, the interesting thing about this uh, is that uh, sort of star C uh, is a poly category. So it might have sort of, uh, we might ask whether it has these sort of representing objects, the same way we can ask whether a multi category has representing objects to be a monoidal category. Um, Sorry, I have, a, yes. I have a dumb Please. question. So I, I would have guessed that that thing you're saying is empty. I would have guessed it would be C of A tensor B semicolon C tensor D. That's, that's what you would think in a prop. So is, so, but this so is I supposed really to be. Generalize from your example correctly about what the rule was. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the, uh, uh here's, l let me, uh, let me write it like this. So suppose I want to talk about, uh, morphisms that have a bunch of, uh, uh, inputs, um, so like uh, A and B uh, and sort of C star and D star, uh, I can have some things coming in that are ordinary objects and some things coming in that are formal dual objects. And I can have some things coming out uh, that are ordinary objects and some things coming out that are formal dual objects. Uh, okay, and now uh, by definition, what this is, uh, is a map from, uh, I just sort of formally turn everything around. Uh, so these duals down here come up here. Uh, and these duals upstairs come down here. Uh, but um, we, in order for this to, to, because we want, I think I didn't explain this very well. Um, because we want, um, we want to think of C as a multi-category and not as a prop. Um, in order for this to work, um, we need exactly one of these objects. Okay, yeah, that's the part I missed. Is it... That's the, one, the part I didn't say. So you, you, thank you for, for pointing that out. <laughs> Your example had that yeah. property. Yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, if if I'm trying to talk about morphisms in star C uh, of this sort, where there's more than where the where the E and F and C and D together. Uh, involve more than one or fewer than one, then um, I have uh, an empty HOM set over here uh, in star C. Sorry, that was star C. Uh, we only have HOM sets in star C when there's exactly one uh, uh, of, the, uh, of these guys. So, um, so what I was saying is, um, we uh, we'd like to ask we we, we want to ask uh, can star C uh, have these representing objects for the tens for for tensors and cotensors? Uh, and the answer is that it has some of them. Right. So, um, a tens the tensor product in C is a tensor product in star C. Okay, um, that's sort of not too surprising. I sort of have two things coming in, I can represent them by that. Uh, similarly, um, the, uh, let's see, uh, the formal dual of this tensor product is the cotensor product of the formal duals. I got that right. Um, and most interestingly, the internal HOM of C is a cotensor product from the formal dual of A to B in star C. Um, and why does that work, right? So imagine uh, I have some F uh, mapping from C into uh, the formal dual of A and then uh, B, what that means uh, by the picture that I drew before, that means that I take the A and turn it around here. Uh, but now uh, I use the, I curry that in, in C. Well, a map from A tensor C into B is the same as a map from C into A to HOM AB. 
Okay, so this this thing here, a hom a b, has the universal property for um, uh, the formal dual of a cotensor b. Okay, so um, so what we've done is we've taken our uh, closed symmetric monoidal category. Uh, and we've embedded it in something that's like a star autonomous category in which um, our internal homs become the, the thing that an internal hom should be in a star autonomous category. Uh, but we're not yet star autonomous because we don't have all of those internal hom, all of those dead tensors and cotensors. Okay, so, so what's missing, uh, what we need to do is we need to add uh, tensors uh, and cotensors uh, to star C, uh, preserving the ones we already had. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty low on time here, uh, unfortunately. So let me try to do this. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I was allowed to go until 11. <laughs> so I'd say John is nodding here. Yes, right. yes, that's fine. Yes, all right. Uh, so uh, the envelope. Okay, so um, there's, a, there's a classical construction whereby we take a category that has some limits and or co-limits and we embed it in a category that has all small limits and co-limits, preserving the ones that we already had. Uh, and uh, it's based on um, the UNEDA embedding. Uh, we take a category, uh, uh, yeah, C maybe, and we embed it in the pre-sheaf category. Uh, and so this is, this is by complete. Uh, and uh, the UNEDA embedding preserves limits in C, uh, but if we want to make it preserve co-limits, um, what we instead, or some co-limits in C, uh, then uh, we can consider only uh, those pre-sheaves that preserve those co-limits. And then that gives us a reflective subcategory of uh, the pre sheaf category, uh, which is again by complete and in which the UNEDA embedding preserves those specified limits and co limits. So the idea is to do the same thing with a, uh, um, uh, a poly category with some specified tensors and cotensors. Uh, and the relevant kind of UNEDA embedding uh, was uh, just defined by Martin Highland under the name envelope. So uh, the question is sort of what um, what are what is the UNEDA embedding of a poly category, or what are the representable functors associated to a poly category? So if if if, say, if p is a poly category, and a is an object of p, then we have representables, which I'm going to write uh, UNEDA a, uh, and uh, uh, co UNEDA a. Uh, and uh, what these are is they, they, they're, they look like sort of like a HOM functor. They take some list of objects uh, as, as sort of an input and some other list of objects as an output. And uh, the, the, they, they give us this, the HOM set in P uh, from, um, uh, from these objects to these objects with C with A added. And similarly here, we get the homs in B from uh, with A added on the left. Um, by the way, Jonas Fry suggested, you mean preserving some limits back there? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Limit <laughs> limits in C are limits in C op, so yeah. Okay, limits. what's an op among friends? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, so this, these are kind of, these are polycategorical versions of the covariant and contravariant representable functors, right? It's like, what do you get? What's left over when you plug in an A somewhere in your, uh, your HOM functor? Uh, but the interesting thing is that they are both objects of the same category, which is the category of modules on P. 
Um, so a module on P um, is a, a, a collection of sets, uh, sort of HOM sets uh, that look like this together with actions on both sides by um, the uh, uh, morphisms of P. So I won't write this all out because I'm low on time. Um, uh, it has HOM sets, uh, sort of it looks like M of uh, U1 to BM CU1 to CN uh, with actions by um, arrows in P. Um, just as if these things were er themselves arrows in P, right? So we're allowed to actions, we, we compose while along a single object. Uh, and this category mod P uh, is in fact closed symmetric monoidal. Uh, and uh, the really neat thing, unlike uh, unlike the uh, ordinary Unita embedding of an ordinary category, um, it contains a canonical object. Namely, the hum functor of P itself. Right, because the nice thing about those poly categories, I can have arbitrary lists of things in the object, just like I did here in the, the representables, I stuck in an A, I can just stick in nothing. And again, I get a module. So um, uh, Highland proved uh, that for any polygatic credit category P, uh, it embeds fully faithfully in uh, the Chu construction of this module category uh, at, with the dualizing object being this canonical thing P, and that's called the envelope of P. So this is this is the the poly categorical Yoneda embedding, you could say. Now, uh, like the ordinary Yoneda embedding, it doesn't preserve tensors and cotensors, uh, but we can do the same trick um, that we did for the ordinary Yoneda embedding. We just consider. Uh, only those modules that respect or preserve some specified uh, tensors and cotensors in P uh, to get uh, an embedding that preserves those. So uh, if uh, if I take if I call these these if I have these these specified things if I call that um, say J that set of specified things um, then uh, I get uh, um, P embedding into this you might call the envelope uh, of P together with J uh, and then uh, the answer to our original question is that for a, a closed symmetric monoidal category C, um, uh, I can take C and I can embed it in the envelope of star P, star C, this poly category together with J, um, where J is, uh, consists of uh, these A tensor B um, being A tensor B and uh, a HOM B being a dual, a formal dual cotensor B. Okay, so that gives us our way of embedding a close symmetric mineral category into any star autonomous category, right? Because this is, this is star autonomous because it's a true construction of a close symmetric mineral category. Uh, uh, and now we're preserving both the tensors and the internal HOMs. This is a closed uh, symmetric monoidal embedding. So we can use the uh, string diagram calculus of this envelope category to uh, reason about C. Okay, um, that's it. If you have to go, you can go. Uh, I can probably stay another minute or two. I teach at 1115, so. Okay, I have one very simple question, yes. which is that when you use, can you use this theorem to then start 
drawing diagrams <coughs> uh, where you sort of work with the embedded version of C. And my real question is, can you like, so you're drawing diagrams as if you're in a star autonomous category, but my real question is, can you like do this without worrying about how you prove this theorem or all this fancy stuff? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so the so, end user can uh, just- Exactly, that's, that's the uh, idea. Because once you know that you have some embedding, right, it's a closed symmetric monoidal embedding, uh, you draw your string diagrams in some star autonomous category, uh, and then uh, you can manipulate them as, as you like and compose them and put them back together and so on. And as, because it's a, it's a full embedding, it's a fully faithful functor, then uh, whatever you end up with, a lo as long as its domains and codomains come from, are in the image of C, then your morphisms that you get are going to be isomorphic to the ones that you had in C. So it doesn't matter what the embedding looks like as long as it, as it, as it works. Mm -hmm. have it. Great. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, you've been getting lots of applause in the <laughs> Zoom chat. Okay. <laughs> very, very quiet applause. <laughs> is, is there a way of extending this to the non-symmetric case? Um, probably. <laughs> I haven't thought about it. Uh, I mean, so uh, everything gets more subtle in the non-symmetric case, right? So uh, the there are different kinds of chew construction for non-symmetric cases, right? So there's one that is sort of where you have an infinite string, a bi-infinite string of objects that are sort of their right duals and left duals. And then there's sort of a cyclic one where you have some sort of cyclic structure. And so uh, I haven't really thought about the non-symmetric case. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you for your talk and let you start thinking about your next, <laughs> next right. class. And, and well, so I, I remind everyone to please come to the uh, chat on Zulips where you can talk to Mike more about all these things and ask all sorts of other kind of questions. Great. I'll see you at one. <laughs>